Aloha. I'm Chef Don Mariama. Welcome to the Culinary Arts Program at Leeward Community College. Um, <clears throat> it's my understanding that we have a lot of um, students as well as teachers joining us from other community college campuses as well as high schools and I believe members of Les Dames d'Escoffier, the Hawaii chapter. So uh, thank you for joining us. Um, today we're very fortunate to have a uh, cooking demonstration featuring Chef Joanne Chang. Today's presentation is being sponsored by the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that supports culinary education statewide for high school students, community college culinary students, as well as offering professional de development opportunities for professional cooks as well as chefs. Uh, before we introduce Chef Chang, I just want to say that I was very fortunate to be able to go to her restaurant. I believe it was the summer before the pandemic hit us. Uh, Myers and Chang, great restaurant. The food, beverage, service, the ambiance all exceeded my expectations. So if you're ever in Boston, I encourage you to go check it out. Uh, great restaurant. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce Haley Matson mathis She's the executive director of the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation. Haley. Aloha, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back here today at Leeward Community College to share this outstanding program with you from the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation. Our foundation's mission is all of the culinary students out there that are watching this, um, and also high school culinary teachers and professionals in the culinary profession. Our goal is, as a nonprofit 501c3, is to raise the bar for culinary in Hawaii and to bring such great opportunities as what we have today with Chef Joanne Chang. Joanne Chang is an exceptional chef in many ways and as, as well as an accomplished businesswoman. She started out by going to Harvard uh, College with a degree and received a degree in applied mathematics and economics, but she and had a career as a management consultant, left that career to follow her passion, which was culinary and baking. She worked at some famed restaurants in Boston, including Rialto, and then she moved to New York to work at Payard, B Payard Patisserie and Bistro. And returned to Boston, and in 2000, she opened her very first flower restaurant. Today, there are nine flower restaurants, as well as Myers and Chang, and flower is very well known as a bakery and cafe in the Boston and Cambridge area. As if all of those uh, accomplishments aren't enough, Joanne is also a James Beard award-winning uh, chef in baking, and this is a tremendous accomplishment uh, in the world, and they've also been recognized for their restaurants by the Boston Globe, and her her articles have been featured, and she has been featured in Gourmet, Food and Wine, Bon Appetit, The New York Times, and it goes on and on, O Magazine, as well as Boston Magazine. You may have seen Joanne on Throwdown with Bobby Flay, and she did beat Bobby Flay with her famous sticky buns, and she may have time to tell you about that a little bit today. She has a commitment in the kitchen to running a very professional operation, and she's also published five cookbooks, and if you don't have this one, Pastry Love, her latest book, I highly recommend it. Uh, her books are, are well known for their precision, and actually when you cook for them, as I have, you actually can follow the directions and achieve the results as she lays it out for you. It's a great book to have in your library. It's our deepest pleasure to have Joanne return to Hawaii. She's generously shared her time with us here, teaching on Maui before coming here. And she's taught for us numerous times with her husband, Christopher Myers, who has, they've shared their restaurant wisdom with those of you who are out in the culinary profession. Joanne, we're honored and thrilled to have you back with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. Aloha and welcome everybody. I am thrilled to be here today to teach you the science of sugar. 
Uh, first, I want to thank Haley. I want to thank the Hawaii Culinary Foundation. I want to thank Leeward Community College for welcoming me so warmly and helping me set up this class. It is such an honor to be here with all of you out into the world. Um, and I'm, I'm as bummed as I am that we can't do this uh, mostly in person. Uh, the benefit of Zoom is that it does open it up to so many of you who maybe could not have come and attended here in person. But I am very excited that there is a small in-person audience here, mm -hmm. so um, they will receive some of the benefits of, of the presentation up here. Um, so I have uh, taught this class for the last nine years at Harvard. It is a class called uh, The Science of Sugar. Uh, and it's something that is very near and dear to my heart because there's so many things about sugar that I am eager to share with everybody, especially if you are a baker. Um, now, there's a lot, of a lot of you are on Zoom. If you want to ask questions, please use the chat or the question feature. We're going to be monitoring. And uh, you know, after I do the demonstrations and talk a little bit about sugar, I would love to hear your questions. I would love to hear the students' questions here um, because my goal is that when you uh, leave this class or you leave this Zoom, you walk away with a better understanding of how sugar works in baking and how sugar works just in, in culinary in general. Um, so let's start, even though this is somewhat virtual, uh, so you're going to have to kind of virtually raise your hand, but I'm curious as to how many of you, or maybe I think that you can do like a thumbs up on Zoom, um, how many of you are actually pastry people, bakers, who are interested in taking this class because you want to learn a little bit about baking? I've got one, <laughs> excellent, two, There's probably some people on Zoom. Okay, great, a lot of thumbs up, thumbs up. wonderful. Now, how many of you maybe are scientists who uh, came to this class because you heard there was a little bit about science and you want to learn about the science of sugar? Excellent, another one, another two, three, and hopefully a couple more. Okay, and then the last question doesn't really apply to all of you on Zoom, but I'm gonna ask the people here in this room, how many of you are here because you heard there's gonna be treats afterwards? <laughs> Everybody's hand goes up, yes. <laughs> Yes, we are going to demonstrate a couple things and you'll have a, little, a chance to taste it uh, here. And it is simple enough that you'll be able to recreate it um, in your classroom or at home. Uh, so we're going to start with a little video montage. I wanted to kind of give you a little sense of how flour my bakery came onto the map. Uh, in 2007, so this is just a little clip from uh, in 2007, I received a phone call from the Food Network. The Food Network said that they wanted me to film the pilot episode of a show called The Science of Sweets. Now, at that point, I had never been on TV. I'd never really done anything except for open my one bakery, and I was about to open a second. But uh, as Haley mentioned, I graduated from Harvard with a degree in math and economics, and I love science, and I love baking. So when the Food Network said, do you want to join us and be uh, and to help us film this new series called The Science of Sugar, The Science of Sweets, I said, I'm there. So they actually flew an entire camera crew to Boston. Then they had me spend eight hours in what they call a green room. It's a room where the background is entirely green so that they can put whatever visuals they want. Um, and then they had me in front of a whiteboard and they had me writing the Fibonacci sequence or writing digits of pi or with a protractor in sticky buns. Now, if you, are, if you know anything about baking and science, you know that the Fibonacci sequence and pi, uh, 3.14, and protractors are not really what we're talking about when we talk about science and, and sweets. However, they are the TV professionals, so I let them do whatever they wanted. I spent an entire hour the first day with a big placard in front of me that said the science of sweets. And for an hour, I popped up from behind the placard in every single angle the science of sweets, the science of sweets, the science of sweets. And in my mind, I thought this is going to be the best show on the Food Network. I'm so excited. So then cut to day two. Day two, they invited 100 Harvard students to my bakery so that I could show them how to make sticky buns. And I thought, great, now we're getting somewhere. Now I'm going to be able to talk a little bit about sugar and baking and yeast. So the cameras are all on me. I'm rolling the sticky buns. I've got my head down, I'm just about to cut into these sticky buns, and I hear this huge applause, and I think to myself, wait a minute, I haven't done anything yet. Like, the sticky buns haven't come out of the oven, it's not time to be excited. And I look up, and coming from the corner into the bakery is Bobby Flay. Now, for those of you who don't know who Bobby Flay is, he is a New York chef 
who at the time was very famous for a show called Throwdown with Bobby Flay. In this show, he goes around to uh, restaurants and bakeries throughout the United States and he challenges the chefs and the pastry chefs to a throwdown, basically a contest on one of their specialty items. Now the entire show is not staged at all. It's entirely, entirely as it looks on, on camera, which is I had no idea that, that it was happening. In fact, at one point when he comes in, I thought to myself, gosh, I know him because he's in the restaurant business and so I knew of him. He's friends with my husband. And I said to him, Bobby, you'll have to wait. I can say hi to you later. I'm filming The Science of Sweets. They had to cut the camera and say to me, no, 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 Joanne, you're not filming The Science of Sweets. You're filming Throwdown with Bobby Flay. And you can actually see that I'm kind of in shock. I'm like, no, there's no way. There's no way. In the end, uh, you know, I was making sticky buns for the camera for the, this Science of Sweets. It turns out Bobby Flay was off camera making sticky buns as well. So then we did a live tasting. It's all on camera. And then uh, the judges have my hand in one hand and his hand in another. And it's entirely, it's not staged. So you have no idea who's going to win. So the whole time I'm sweating bullets. Am I going to win? I didn't even know this was going to be a competition. I thought I was teaching a class. And then my arm went up and we won. So winning throwdown. Yay! <laughs> thank you. If you're out there clapping, thank you so much. Now, being on Throwdown was such a thrill, and I loved it, um, but I have to say, there was a pretty big part of me that was disappointed that we weren't actually filming The Science of Sweets. I love the alchemy of pastry so much that if I were to actually have a show called The Science of Sweets, I would make the first episode about sugar. And in fact, I love it so much, that, and I'm so fascinated by how sugar works, that I actually wrote a book called Baking with Less Sugar because I was just amazed at what you can do when you don't have sugar in baking. So Baking with Less Sugar came out in 2015 and I was able to make about 100 recipes that either had very little white sugar or absolutely no white sugar. So now, the taste of sugar. It is engineered inside of us to be a positive thing. If you give a baby something sweet, instantly they're happy. Instantly they're joyful. On the flip side, if you give a baby something bitter or something sour, it becomes dangerous. This is something that the baby does not want to try. So we are born with an affinity to sweets. Sugar is such a huge part of our lives that if you think about it, we end pretty much every meal with something sweet. Maybe not breakfast and lunch, but every dinner time, uh, we tend to you know, eat our meal and then we want to end with something sweet. This is how important sugar is to our lives. Now, think about your favorite dessert. Probably the key ingredient is sugar, but there are a couple of exceptions of desserts that don't have sugar. So for example, we have fresh fruit. It has natural sugar, but there is no added sugar. Some people also enjoy ending a meal with cheese. Those aren't my people, but for those of you who like cheese, I guess I'll grant you that. That's a way to end a meal. But I would say, by and large, most of us want to end the meal with a dessert. So here's some pictures of some various desserts that you might end a meal with. Now, when I wrote Baking with Less Sugar, and imagine that you're trying to write a, a cookbook where you're not using any sugar, what do you think the biggest challenge is? The biggest challenge, I thought, was going to be, how do I trick my taste buds so that something that doesn't have a lot of sugar tastes sweet, right? You would think that would be kind of the, the crux of the book, is how to trick your taste buds maybe with a little extra spice or a little extra vanilla extract or something like that. And it's true. That is something that is very important to baking uh, and, and in, in desserts, is you need the sugar for sweetness. But again, this will be a little bit tricky with Zoom, but I encourage you to type in. And for the students here, I want you to think as well. Let's take a moment and ask, ask yourself, what is a dessert that I can think of in which the only role that sugar plays is for sweetness, okay? So try to think of, and maybe type into the Zoom, but think about the desserts that you can think of that the only thing the sugar is doing is adding sweetness. It, it's actually a very, very small list. Any ideas out there in the audience? Halpia. Say again? Halpia. Halpia, that's coconut, right? Coconut. Like a coconut um, 
pudding. Coconut pudding. Cornstarch base. Yep. That's yes. Actually, I think there's a slide for um, pudding on here, right? Yes. Yeah, so so exactly. Thank you, Caleb. So help you up pudding or any sort of pudding. A lot of the, the purpose of the sugar is just to add sweetness. If you take out the sugar, the, the pudding acts the same, uh, but it just doesn't taste sweet until you add the sugar. Same thing with Jell-O. Uh, I think there's a slide for Jell-O up here. Jell-O without uh, any sugar is just unflavored gelatin. Edible, but you know, not very pleasant, but still it's fine. You add sugar to it and it becomes a dessert. Um, another dessert is uh, chocolate. If you just take cacao and eat cacao straight, or unsweetened chocolate, it's not pleasant. We don't call that dessert. But adding sugar to it means that it's something that I might end a meal with and call it dessert. Uh, I think there's a couple other slides. Maybe cheesecake? Berries and cream, exactly. So fresh berries, a little whipped cream, delicious dessert. But if you really want to amp it up a little bit, add a little bit of sugar, and you have something that's a little bit more of an elegant dessert or a little bit more presentable. Um, and cheesecake. Cheesecake is similar to the halpia pudding. Uh, a custard, you, when you add the sugar, it adds sweetness. And the only role that the sugar is playing in the cheesecake is just to make it taste uh, sweet. Now, we are actually going to talk about seven other things that sugar does that have nothing to do with sweetness that make a dessert work. The first thing, item number one is creaming. Now, there's a slide that's coming up uh, where you see somebody actually in her garden, and she's taking a garden hoe, and she's actually um, trying to prep her garden for uh, the spring. I want you to imagine sugar. Uh, I want you to imagine a little bit of sugar, and imagine butter. And imagine that you're putting them together in a bowl, OK? Now, the, the butter's going to be yellowish. The sugar's white. And as you start to mix the butter and the sugar together, what's happening? If you take the sugar and take it into a microscope and look down, 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 down to the microscopic level, what is it? We know that sugar is a crystal, right? You're going to see like a little crystal, a little hard thing. Imagine that times millions. And you've got all of these microscopic sugar crystals mixed into the butter. Now take that butter and sugar and take a wooden spoon or a, a mixer and start mixing, 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 mixing. What is it doing? That sugar, those little crystals, they are acting exactly the same way a garden hoe works on ground when you're trying to get the, the dirt aerated before you plant seeds. Now, I know here in Hawaii, it probably doesn't ever freeze over. But in Boston, where I am from, it freezes over. And in uh, April, when I want to start planting a garden, there's no way anything is going to grow in there. And so I take that garden hoe and I aerate the, the, the earth. That's exactly what's happening when you mix sugar and butter together and you cream it together. It's actually um, a baking term that you probably all know of creaming butter and sugar together. It's called that because once you start to mix the sugar and the butter together, it turns paler and paler until it becomes almost pale like heavy cream. It, be it takes on the color of, of cream. And that is because you're adding so much air to the butter that it lightens the color. Now this air is so important, especially when you're making a cookie or a cake batter, because all of those microscopic air bubbles that are trapped in the butter, you've taken that, that firm piece of butter and you've aerated it with all of that sugar, when you mix that butter and sugar with maybe some eggs, maybe a little flour, usually some baking soda or baking powder, all of that, when it goes into the oven, all of those microscopic air bubbles through the action of leavening with baking soda and baking powder the, and through the action of steam, all of the liquid that's in your cake batter, the steam acts and the heat of the oven acts to take all of those air bubbles and make them all a little bit bigger. So you've all seen a cake. You take the cake batter, you put it in the oven. They always say fill it like halfway to 2 thirds. Well, why is that? Because it's going to rise because that cake batter, all of those bubbles are getting bigger. So the more butter and sugar you cream uh, into, the, uh, into the cake, the better you'll have in terms of final texture. So you can see, actually, that there are a bunch of cakes and what we did was we actually baked some cakes where we didn't cream the butter and sugar together. And you can see that it's a denser cake. 
and then the ones in which we cream the butter and sugar together, it's a much lighter and fluffier texture. So in this case, the sugar is not doing anything about sweetness for the cake or the cookie, but what it's doing is it's allowing you to bake off a beautiful, fluffy, velvety cake. So that's a huge, important role that sugar plays in baking. Okay, so that was number one. Number two, sugar is hygroscopic. So what does that mean? Sugar basically attracts all of the moisture that's in the air. So here in Hawaii, it's so, there's so much moisture. If you have a baked good that has a lot of sugar in it, it will stay fresher for longer because it's just gonna attract all of the moisture that's in the air. When I checked into my hotel yesterday here, um, uh, they gave me a piece of banana bread, a beautiful, delicious piece of banana bread. And we, we checked in yesterday, but we ate it this morning. And my husband took a bite and he thought, why does this still taste like it's fresh baked? And I knew because it is all the sugar that is in, uh, in, that, in that banana bread. It's attracting all of the moisture that's in the air. That's why when you go to the supermarket aisle, for example, and you see a lot of baked goods, there's a number of different reasons why those baked goods can actually sit on the shelves for weeks to come. Some of it is preservatives, but a lot of it is also because there's a lot of sugar in all of these baked goods. Now, what is uh, interesting is that when I wrote this book, Baking with Less Sugar, instantly our flour guests asked, are you going to put some of these recipes on the flour pastry counter? And I wanted to. I'd spent two years testing all of these recipes. But because all of the recipes had little sugar, as soon as I put it out on the counter, if it didn't sell within by the end of the day, I couldn't sell it the next day. So we tried to put some things on the counter, but most of the times, if it didn't sell immediately, we would have to throw it away. So it ended up not being a very um, profitable venture to put on the, on the bakery counters. But when I'm baking at home, I definitely like to bake with a little less sugar because I know that we're gonna eat it all in a day. Okay, another thing that sugar does is it actually lowers the freezing point of, uh, of frozen desserts. So I'm going to show you this video. We made uh, grapefruit sorbet. We made some with no sugar. Then we put, um, I think it's a half a cup, then a cup, then two cups. So as you add more sugar to the grapefruit sorbet, you can see in the video that the uh, grapefruit sorbet that has no sugar is extremely hard to spoon. As you add a little bit more sugar, it becomes much softer. And then when you add two cups of sugar, it's so soft, it's almost liquid. So what's happening here? What is the sugar doing to your sorbet or to your ice cream? Now, uh, sugar actually lowers the freezing point of a, a, a frozen dessert. So um, in Boston, where I live, about now actually, I think it's starting to snow in the next couple weeks. Um, once it starts to snow, the roads are iced over. And if you try to drive on them, it's really dangerous. So what do the plows do? They come out and they try to plow, but it's still really slippery. So they end up sprinkling salt all over the roads. And what does the salt do? The salt does exactly the same thing as what sugar does. It actually lowers the freezing point. And so if you've got uh, ice on the road, which freezes at zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, as you add salt to it, it actually depresses the freezing temperature. So if the temperature outside is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to be ice. But as soon as I put some uh, salt on that ice, it lowers it to maybe 20 degrees or maybe 15 degrees. And that's what keeps the roads nice and slushy so that the plows can continue to come and we can drive on the roads. That's exactly what sugar does with frozen desserts. When you have sugar, and you mix it into a sorbet base or a chocolate, uh, sorry, an ice cream base, it depresses the freezing point. So when you take that, that uh, frozen sorbet that you're making or ice cream and you put it in the freezer, the next day when you come and you spoon it, it's still spoonable, it's still velvety, it's still luscious. That is because of the sugar. Now when I wrote my book, Baking with Less Sugar, I really wanted to come up with some uh, ice, cream, ice cream recipes that didn't have a lot of sugar. And so um, one of the ones I wanted to make was just a simple chocolate ice cream. Let's just use the sugar that, that is in the chocolate and let's use that to sweeten up my ice cream base. So I made a chocolate ice cream, no sugar, just sweetened with the sweetness of the, the sweetened chocolate, hoping that that would be enough to keep it sweet and, and palatable. And it was, 
But then when I went into the freezer and tried to spoon it out, it was hard. There was no way I was going to serve this to anybody. And that's because sugar, again, depresses the freezing point. It's what allows you to have a frozen dessert that is really creamy and enjoyable. So what I did for the book is I added another thing that allows the freezing uh, point to be depressed. And any, any guesses on what you can add to lower the freezing point? We know sugar, we know salt, but any other guesses? Uh, Anybody on Zoom? Condensed milk, the condensed milk has a lot of sugar, but you're right, if you were to make an ice cream with condensed milk, it would also be nice and creamy because of all the sugar, totally. And in fact, uh, I think it is in this book, or it might be one of my other books, I do an ice cream that is just using sweetened condensed milk because there's enough sugar in the sweetened condensed milk to allow the ice cream to be nice and creamy. But the other thing that depresses the freezing point of uh, frozen dessert is alcohol. So my chocolate ice cream became chocolate bourbon ice cream. And now it's creamy and it's something that you can serve and it has no additional sugar. So it's a very interesting um, uh, trick that sugar does is it allows everything to be nice and creamy. Okay, now another thing that sugar does is it stabilizes egg foams. So um, let me do a demo first and then I'll explain to you what exactly is happening. So we have egg whites. I'm just going to put them here in this mixer and I'm going to turn this on and whip it up until it's nice and airy. I know there's a lot of pastry students out there and I know you all have studied a lot of pastry so you know that egg whites when they first start out I'm trying to find where the camera is. okay and you know that the egg whites are yellow and viscous right this is kind of gloppy it's like not actually. So once you start to whip it up, what happens? You know that it starts to get airy, right? And I know you guys can't see, but I'm going to tell you what it went from looking like this to now it's white and airy and foamy. And it starts to look like when you're on the beach and the, the waves crash in, you got all that foam, sea foam. That's exactly what this looks like now. Now as I continue to whip, I'm continuing to add more and more air. And I'm going to take this until it's whipped and it's kind of, not stiff, but until it holds a little bit of shape. And I'm not adding any sugar. So this is just whipped egg whites with no sugar. So I'm just going to show you what that's like. So you can see that, right? It's just foamy and white. It went from yellow and viscous to nice foamy and white. Remember, no sugar, just plain egg white. So I'm going to take this and dump it out into a bowl. This is going to be exhibit number one is our egg whites. And remember, I started off this point by saying that sugar stabilizes the egg foams. So you can guess that maybe this bowl of egg whites looking beautiful and fluffy and wonderful right now, you can guess that it's probably not going to be too stable. But I want you to see it. We're going to test that in a little bit. Now we're going to do the exact same thing. Get the mixer going. Another one cup of egg whites. And let's get this going again. So we have the same thing. We've got the one cup of egg whites, yellow, viscous, thick, gloppy. And as it whips, it turns from yellow and, and thick to airy and foamy. And as it gets foamier and foamier, it gets whiter and whiter. And now this batch, I'm actually going to add some sugar. I'm going to wait just a little bit until it's gotten really nice and foamy. And now I'm going to add a little bit of sugar. This is about a cup of sugar for a cup of whites. I'm just going to sprinkle it on slowly, slowly. Already I can hear a difference. I can hear that the whipped egg whites just seem a little bit like the, the pitch of the whipping is a little bit deeper because it's actually starting to get glossy. 
And as I continue to add sugar, the sea foam quality of these egg whites is starting to get a little bit less like sea foam and more like maybe shaving cream. Much, much finer in terms of air bubbles. And I'm gonna explain all of this. I just wanted to kind of give you this, this part of the demo. So I didn't let that go for too long, but long enough so that you could see the difference. So can you see the difference in the glossiness of this meringue versus the stuff that I did previously? And that's because we have a cup of sugar added in. So I'm going to scoop this out into a second bowl. And at the end of this lecture, we're going to take a look at this meringue. We're going to see the difference between the one that has been stabilized with sugar versus the one that hasn't. Oops, wrong way. OK. So we have not stabilized with sugar, and we have stabilized with sugar. You can already tell there's a little bit of a difference. The, the foamier one is the one not stabilized with sugar, and the glossier one is stabilized with sugar. But we're going to check back here in about 20 minutes and see the difference. So what is happening here? What is the sugar actually doing? This is what's happening. I want you to imagine that you have a beautiful ceramic vase that you want to ship over to the mainland. Are you going to take that vase and put it in a box and ship it just like that? No, of course not. You are going to buy lots of packing peanuts, or you're going to buy those bubble things. You're going to buy something that's going to protect your beautiful ceramic vase so that it makes it over to the mainland in one piece. When I am whipping egg whites, what I am doing is I am taking the egg whites, which are made up of water and protein strands. So the, the composition of an egg white is mostly protein and water. Think about when you want to eat really healthy and you have an egg white omelet, right? It's just all protein. That's exactly what egg whites are. It's just the protein. Now, the protein in the egg whites are actually little strands, if you go down and look at them in the microscopic level. And as you are whipping egg whites, what happens is you're taking those strands, and they're kind of all jumbled up in the egg whites. That's what gives it that yellow color, is because all of the proteins are just kind of like all jumbled up inside of each other. As soon as you whip it, the tines of the whisk start to take those jumbled up proteins and they start to spread them out. And as they spread them out, the, the protein strands start to catch a little bit on each other, but they're spread out. And then they become spread out enough that they can actually capture the air. And as they're capturing the air, that is what's creating the foam, OK? Now, this one, the one that has no sugar, that's what we've done, is we've stretched out the egg whites, and we've created all of these bubbles, and you have a lot of foam. You have a lot of foam, but then with this one, we added sugar. And the difference is, is that as soon as you add sugar to these egg white bubbles that have been forming, the sugar mixes with the water that's in the egg whites. Remember how we said egg whites are mostly water with some egg white uh, protein strands? The sugar, when you add sugar to meringue, it mixes with the water that's in the egg whites. It forms a sugar syrup that we can't see, but that's in there. And that sugar syrup coats all of the air bubbles. And that sugar syrup acts like packing peanuts. And that's the sugar syrup is protecting all of the air bubbles that's inside the egg white meringue. And this is so important because once you have a stable egg white meringue, you can do so many things in baking. You can make butter creams, you can make angel food cakes, you can make lemon meringue pies. I mean, it is endless, the things you can do. In fact, when I was starting out as a baker, uh, before I got into baking professionally, um, I was just baking by reading cookbooks and, and mixing things by hand. And I kept reading recipes about meringues. But for any of you who've tried to make a meringue by hand, it's totally doable, but it's very laborious. So I finally, I was a consultant um, 
uh, working in business and I finally saved up enough money to buy my own mixer so that I could then have a machine help me make egg whites because there's so many things you can do with egg whites. So that is how important sugar is when you're making a meringue. It protects the air bubbles and then allows you to make all of the things, sponge cake, genoise, uh, sponge cake, genoise, angel food cake, uh, meringues for lemon meringue pie, um, just again, so many buttercreams, which we're gonna make in a little bit. Okay, we're gonna move on to another thing that sugar does. Uh, and I wanna see if I can, I'm just gonna try to time, oh, thank you. I'm gonna try to time some of the, the cooking of the sugar, because we're gonna cook sugar three times, and I wanna show you. So we're gonna move on to another thing that sugar does as I get this guy ready. Okay, so bear with me for one second as I prep for another demo. We got this, this, and this. Okay, great. So uh, we are now going to talk about another thing that sugar does, and that is it aids in browning. So on the screen, you will see two pictures of coffee cake. I know the students here, you can't see it, but there's two pictures of coffee cake. One is golden brown and luscious, and oh my gosh, this is the coffee cake that we make in flour, sour cream coffee cake. The second one, honestly, is in very insipid looking. It's very pale, it's not appetizing at all. But the other thing that sh another thing that sugar does is it aids in the browning of baked goods. So, Picture your favorite bakery. When you walk in and you see the cookies and the cakes and the pies and the tarts, it's mostly brown. And that's because the sugar is allowing your baked good to be nice and golden brown. So what's happening is a version of the Maillard reaction. Some of you who are in culinary might have heard about the Maillard reaction because we talk about it when you talk about grilling a piece of meat. You take a steak and you put it on the grill and then the Maillard reaction is what allows for that crust that makes for a really great charred steak. But surprisingly enough, the Maillard reaction also shows up in baking, and that's through uh, when you heat up sugar at about 310 degrees, sugar starts to actually change in structure. And there's, there's uh, sugars and proteins in whatever it is you're baking, and at that temperature, the sugars actually bond with the proteins. It might be in your egg, it might be in your dairy, um, and it bonds with the proteins and it actually creates these ring-like structures and what they do is they refract light differently and that's what makes your beautiful croissant nice and golden brown or your cake nice and golden brown or the coffee cake as you saw on the screen. Now I, I bring up a lot of examples of my book Baking with Less Sugar because when I wrote this book I really thought it was going to change how we operated Flour Bakery but as you can see from the picture of the coffee cake that coffee cake is not something that I can put on a counter and expect people to be, um, uh, to be intrigued by and want to buy. So we ended up not putting that on the counter. And in fact, when we were taking the pictures for the book, Baking with Less Sugar, uh, when, you, when you write a cookbook, there's, um, there's a point when you're actually putting together all of the photography and you take all the pictures and nowadays everything is done you know, online and virtual, so you can take all the pictures and you can actually just email them to your editor and your, to your photo editor. And so we, we emailed them directly to the photo editor and she said, no, this coffee cake does not look good. We cannot put this in the book. We're going to Photoshop it. And I said, no, because if you Photoshop it, everybody's gonna think that their coffee cake made with a third of the amount of sugar it normally does is gonna be, they're gonna think theirs is wrong but the picture that you see is exactly what uh, comes out. You don't have enough sugar to create that Maillard reaction, and so it refracts light in a very different way, and it looks a little pale and unappetizing. So the impact is that you have something that's not really uh, enjoyable or appetizing looking, but it still tastes great. But just remember that if you have something with less sugar, it's gonna look a little bit different. Okay, we have two more things but we also have a little bit of sugar going so I want to let me get this one started too. Um, so we're going to cut a little bit to this demo I just want to show you we are going to make what's called an Italian meringue. <clears throat> this is when you cook sugar 
Uh, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. So the timing's a little off, um, but I will address, the, I will explain this in a little bit. But in making an Italian meringue, so we made the meringue earlier. Now I'm going to take egg whites and put them in a bowl. And I'm actually going to cook this sugar syrup. This is just sugar and water in this pot. And I'm cooking it to about 238 degrees. But if you don't have a candy thermometer, what you can do is actually freeze your finger by putting it in a cup of ice water. And then dip your finger straight into the ice water, I mean into the sugar. And then you can see, can you see that against my lay? You can see the sugar syrup that results. So this is now kind of not even softball yet. It's kind of mushy. But I can actually tell that now this sugar is starting to get to be a lot firmer. So this sugar syrup, you can't see it in here, but I'm telling you, it is boiling away. And now I have, can you see that? This is what's called softball. This is sugar. I'm trying to do it against something you can see it. So this is sugar that has cooked and now has been cooked to a temperature of 238 degrees, which means when I plunge it into ice water, it actually forms a soft ball. And this allows me to make what's called an Italian meringue. So I've got egg whites in this mixer. I'm going to turn it on, and I'm going to drizzle this sugar syrup carefully down the side of the bowl. So now I have hot sugar syrup. So now I have hot sugar syrup that I've drizzled down the side of this bowl that has egg whites in it. And What's going to happen is very similar to the meringue that I made with the sugar and the egg whites just straight, but this meringue is going to be a lot more stable. And that is because we have cooked the sugar syrup up to 238 degrees. So the sugar that I put into this original meringue was just room temperature sugar. It's like 75 degrees in here, and it's not liquid. But this liquid sugar was, because I added because I added heat, heat to it, I could bring and made it liquid. I could actually bring up that temperature to 238 degrees. It actually changed the temperature and allows me to make a really, really stable meringue. And then I'm going to add a pound of butter to it, and we're going to make what's called an Italian meringue. So while that's whipping, I'm going to put that aside. We're going to talk about another thing that sugar does. I'm just going to let this whip up and cool down for a little bit. We're going to talk about another thing that sugar does in pastries. And that is that sugar tenderizes and inhibits gluten development. So gluten is a big buzzword these days. We're all talking about gluten-free and gluten intolerant and gluten sensitive. But gluten is actually very, very important in baking. So there's sometimes when you want a lot of gluten. Try to think of your favorite artisan bread loaf. It's nice and it's chewy. It's got big holes in it. It's got a lot of texture. And that's because there's a lot of gluten that has been developed in your bread dough. It makes it really, really appetizing. And it's like you can tell somebody's put a lot of love into that loaf of bread when it's got a lot of great chew. So that is when you want gluten development. However, think about all those adjectives I just talked about, chew and heft and hearty. Do you want to apply those adjectives to the next cake that you bake? I don't think so. You don't want somebody to say, wow, thanks for making me a cake that was chewy and hearty and hefty. No, you want a cake that is tender and velvety and melts in your mouth. Now, what is it that allows for a cake to be that tender? It's sugar. So we're going to go into another little science lesson here. 
when you take a bowl of flour, I want you all to imagine a bowl of flour, and I want you to imagine that you mix in some water into that flour. We all know what that's like, right? It's like messy and gloppy and whatever. It's just like, blah, it's a mess. As you're adding water to flour, here's what's happening. Flour is made up of two, thing, two protein strands, one called glutenin and one called gliadin. They are activated when you add water to the flour. So you add water to the flour and the flour wakes up and the glutenin strands and the gliadin strands, they find each other. And they find each other and they find each other and they find each other. And they hook up, just like with the egg whites, they hook up. And as they hook up, and as you have water mixed in with flour and they hook up, eventually they start to hook up a lot. And it's sort of like uh, when you have like a bunch of rubber bands in your backpack, take a, a bag of rubber bands, throw them in your backpack. At the end of the day, somehow they've all found each other, right? It's all like a big jumbled ball. That's exactly what's happening with water in flour. The glutenin and gliadin strands, they all find each other, they all bind up to each other, and then they create those same webbed network that the egg whites do. The protein strands hold on to each other and they form, they form uh, little like air bubbles. And then if you put something like yeast in there, then eventually the air bubbles start to get bigger as the yeast start to do their um, their gas ex explosions, you get more and more bubbles in your bread dough. So remember, we're back with our bowl of flour that we've mixed some water in and it's all gloopy and gloppy. If you take that flour and it's gloopy and gloppy and you just keep mixing it with your hands or with a mixer, they keep mixing it with your hands and you keep mixing it and mixing it and mixing it. First, it's kind of like batter, right? It's like a, a pancake batter. But if you keep going, and I, I want you to try this at home or in class, I want you guys to try this. If you keep going, keep going, keep going, it starts becoming less like a batter and more like a dough because more and more of those strands are holding on to each other. And you'll see that it'll start to get stretchy. What, be, what was soft like a, like a pancake batter actually starts to have like a little bit of heft and, and stretch. And that is because all of these strands are starting to hold on to each other. Now, when you're making a bread, that's a great thing because you've got all these strands holding on to each other. You add in a little bit of yeast, the yeast start to activate, and then the yeast start to expel, like, expel a little bit of gas. And then the gas is what creates all of those bubbles, which then allow your bread dough to rise. And then when you put it into the oven, it rises even more because all those gases are expanding. And that's what gives your bread all of that wonderful, holy texture. It's so good. But again, we're not making bread now. We are here for the science of sweets, which means that we put sugar in there. And what does the sugar do? The sugar acts like a little kibosh and doesn't allow those protein strands uh, in the flour to, to seek each other out. And so as soon as you add sugar when you're making a cake batter, again, for example, then even if you add liquid to your cake batter, usually there's like buttermilk or I mean, there's almost always eggs or buttermilk or milk or um, maybe a little yogurt or something. As soon as you add all of that, uh, the, the sugar is gonna protect the flour so that when you actually add the liquid, they can't form all of those strands. And that's what allows, that's one of the things that helps your cake become really, really tender. Okay, the last thing that sugar does uh, is it allows pastries to be really crispy. So if you're baking, for example, a sugar cookie that has a lot of sugar in it, you've got your cake batter or your cookie batter, you've got your cookie dough, you put it in the oven, it bakes, and then when it cools, all of that sugar has gone up in temperature. It's gone past 300 degrees to 350, and it starts to caramelize. And then as it cools, it actually it sets as caramel inside the cookie. And that's what gives you a little bit of crisp when you have a cookie. Or if you're baking a cake, that top part that's getting a little bit of crispy. And that's another thing that sugar does. So you can see that the role of sugar is not just to make things sweet, but it's instead to do all of these other incredible things. It's so important when you're baking and it does so much more than just add the sweetness. So I hope you walk away with that understanding of how sugar acts in all of your baking. 
Now we're going to talk about the stages of sugar. If you take sugar and water and just mix it together and then bring it up in temperature, then as it goes through different, as it gets higher and higher in temperature, the sugar actually acts differently and you can use it differently. So we're going to start with thread stage, uh, which is something that you can use just to sweeten your iced tea. Then we go to soft ball, I think it's uh, soft ball stage is next, 238. And that's when we make this Italian meringue, for example. Um, when you bring sugar up to that point, it, stabilize, it can stabilize egg foams. Uh, then you can go up to hard ball stage, and it goes up to 248 degrees. And I believe that's when you can start to make nougats. Then as you continue to go up in temperature, the sugar goes through different stages. And again, that means you take that sugar syrup and you put it in some ice water and you see how it reacts. It goes through soft crack and it goes through hard crack. You got soft ball, firm ball, hard ball, soft crack, firm crack, and then finally it goes to caramel. All of those stages are important when you're using, when you're uh, baking with sugar because they will help, they will help your final baked good in terms of the texture that you're trying to give that baked good. So, Coming back to this Italian meringue, we took sugar syrup to 238 degrees and we drizzled it down. We drizzled it down into some egg whites and now I have a really beautiful white fluffy meringue and now I'm going to add a pound of butter. Let me just stop this and show you. So you can see how beautiful this meringue is. Nice and glossy. And now it's ready for the addition of butter. And this is what we call Italian meringue buttercream. So you just take softened butter and you add it bit by bit to the Italian meringue. And slowly, the butter starts to mix into the meringue. And depending on the temperature of your butter, sometimes if the butter's a little firm, your meringue might break, your buttercream might break, and it'll start to look curdled. And you'll think you've done something wrong. But you haven't. You just have to give the whole thing a little bit more time. In this instance, the butter is nice and creamy and soft. So it should blend in pretty easily to this Italian meringue. So I've got a pound of butter in here. A pound of butter, I've got five egg whites and one and a quarter cups of sugar. I brought the sugar to 238 degrees. I drizzled it down the side. I made an Italian meringue with the egg whites. And then I added the butter. And I'm just gonna whip this for a couple seconds longer. And now we have the most beautiful buttercream. This is an Italian meringue buttercream. And this you'll use to fill and decorate cakes and wedding cakes and you can pipe on cupcakes. It's a beautiful meringue, very easy to use, very easy to make, and kind of a workhorse in any bakery. Okay, so for the two more demos. One, I'm going to show you how to make a very simple praline. I have about four cups of sugar here in a pot with a little bit of water and I'm cooking this past 310 degrees. This is going to be nice and golden brown. And as soon as it turns golden brown, I'm actually going to add some toasted almonds. You can add almonds, you can add peanuts, you can add macadamia nuts, and we're just going to make a very simple brittle. Um, if you wanted to, you could also stir in a little bit of vanilla, salt, and baking soda, and that will aerate the mixture. But I'm just going to make the most simple of brittles by just taking sugar and caramelizing it, 
and then adding the nuts. So I'm going to see if you guys can see into the, so it's starting to get golden brown. And for those of you on Zoom, you can't smell it, but I think all of you here can smell that the sugar starting to caramelize and it's got a delicious, it tastes like a creme brulee, like the creme brulee that you guys made me earlier today. So now this is golden brown. I'm going to go a little bit further. And I'm just cooking this sugar until it's nice golden brown. A little darker. Now I'm going to add these nuts. Quickly give it a stir so that it covers all the nuts. I know some of you are in um, classrooms nearby, so you'll have to come after the class and come try this out. Dump all of that out. There. And then immediately, while it's still hot, spread out the almonds. And you can see that it's really, really, really hot, and it doesn't stay, uh, it doesn't stay movable for very long. So you gotta do everything you can to spread it out while it's hot. And then when it cools, it makes the most delicious brittle. It's such a good snack and so easy to make. So we're gonna let that cool, and then we're gonna split it, all of us, into eight pieces. <laughs> Okay, uh, last thing then is, thank you. So the last thing, we saved the best for last, but it's gonna take a little time. So while we're waiting, I want to open it up to questions and discussion. But first, I want to show off this glorious croquembouche that Chef Abby made for us. So a croquembouche, is a very traditional uh, French dessert that is typically served at weddings. And you make this gorgeous tower, you fill the, the cream puffs, pâte à choux, with uh, creme pâtissière, you put some pastry cream inside, um, and then you put it all together with caramel. You can see the beautiful caramel that's holding it all together. And then you cover the whole thing in spun sugar. And spun sugar is when you take the sugar syrup and you take it at least to hard crack stage but I usually take it a little bit further um, and then once the sugar cools down it becomes much stiffer and then you can actually do what's called spinning sugar which is you can take the sugar strands and stretch them out so that it becomes like threads and it looks like it's a beautiful web of, of sugar spun sugar that we're going to put over this whole thing. So I've got a pot of sugar on the stove right now. It's boiling away. It's gonna take probably another five or six minutes for it to come to the right temperature, and it's gonna take another five minutes or so to cool down. So we're gonna wait patiently. And as we're waiting, I want to encourage um, all of you to type in questions. I want all of you guys to type, or you don't type in questions. <laughs> I want you to ask questions. Um, and I wanna answer all of your questions about baking and and cooking and well no not cooking let's stick with baking <laughs> and sugar running a bakery anything at all that i can answer for you i am here to share anything and everything that i can so what's your favorite baked good to eat and then what's your favorite baked good to make so my favorite baked good to eat, um, I, I know this isn't, it's not baked per se, but ice cream. I love ice cream. I could just eat ice cream all day long. In fact, we were having a conversation the other day, Haley and Mike and Christopher and I, about if we were on a desert island and we could only bring one type, one person's music and one type of food, what would it be? It's a fun dinner, dinner party conversation. You can only listen to one artist and you can only eat one type of food. And I thought to myself, gosh, I don't know if I could really eat ice cream only for the rest of my life. But then last night we got ice cream for dinner, uh, after dinner, and I thought, yes, I could. <laughs> so ice cream. Uh, my favorite pastry to make, uh, I think, is um, croissant. Croissant to me is 
it's the epitome of what pastry is all about, which is it's a lot of patience. Um, it's a lot of, uh, it's simple. There's only a couple of ingredients in a great croissant. There's butter, flour, a little bit of yeast, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of salt. That's it. And I mean, if you think about that, that is the base of so many desserts. In fact, I'm thinking these pâtes de that's the same thing. It's about, oh, plus eggs. Butter, flour, um, a little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar. I mean, it's just amazing. But with croissant, the way in which you make the, the, the dough and then you layer in the butter, and if you do it right, and I imagine it's challenging here because it's so warm here. So you must have like a special room if you do this in Hawaii because you really need the dough and the uh, butter to be at the same temperature in order to make all of the layers. But when it's, and it's so challenging, and when you mess up, which is all the time, it's really frustrating, but when you get it right, it's, it's amazing. So that's my favorite to make. Okay, I have a couple questions for you. Great. Um, what initially got you interested in, to the, in the science of cooking and baking? I think what got me interested in the science of cooking and baking is that I really wanted to know the why of everything. Like I can follow a recipe, like you can all read a recipe and say, mix this, do this, do that. But I was really curious, well, if I don't do that, then what happens? Like, wh and why? Why doesn't, you know, why is it so important that the leavening be measured out to the quarter teaspoon? Um, why is it important that the temperature of the butter is so important if you're making a croissant or if you're making a cake batter? Uh, and so I could learn the how, but I couldn't figure out the why until I learned the science. So to me, it's all just, it's just fascinating to me that you can take literally, I think it's like 10 ingredients in pastry. Uh, you could open a pastry shop with 10 ingredients and you can make 50,000 different desserts with those 10 ingredients. And that's all about the science. Exactly. Um, what did you take away from Baking Impossible? Do you apply some of the same skills from the show to your own shop? So Baking Impossible is a, uh, a reality TV show on Netflix that just came out last month that I was a judge on. Um, in this show, uh, the, the show pairs bakers and engineers together. And so there were eight uh, Baconeer teams where you would have a pastry chef and an engineer. And each team was given, every, every challenge, uh, every mission was given to all the teams and they would have to create, for example, the first one was to create a boat made out of all edible ingredients that could float and traverse like a little waterway and then make it to the end within 45 seconds. Um, so it was an incredible experience and I loved it. Um, but whether or not I've actually applied any of that to my baking, uh, not really. I mean, <laughs> our pastries don't float or move or withstand earthquakes that was another one uh, there was an edible costume one we don't wear any of ours so <laughs> you don't go to work no, in your pastries no, i don't i mean i i wear i wear the yeah. pastries on accident when it gets splattered all over me but certainly not on purpose um is there anything you've had in hawaii that's influenced or inspired your menu so i have to say i'm going to show off nicholas's creme brulee <laughs> So I love creme brulee, and uh, right before I got here, Nicholas showed, uh, offered me a creme brulee, and I, I was like, oh, creme brulee, I love creme brulee. I had no idea there was gonna be this little ube layer underneath. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. And it's so good because I don't love, how do you say it, ube, ube? Ube. 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 I don't love that flavor typically. It can be a little bit thick and cloying, but you've done something to lighten it up a little bit, and then you added the creaminess on top, and you put it all together, and then it's got that crackly top. And I, I talked to Nicholas about you, you brulee, I always brulee twice. When you make a creme brulee, I put a little bit of sugar, I melt the sugar just like you did here, and then I put another layer of sugar, and then I melt that and then brulee that. And that's the part that gets nice and crispy and brown. And so all of the texture and the creaminess and the flavor were really fantastic. Um, could you give us some of the unique challenges of being a, a chef owner? So we were just talking about this prior to starting the class. <laughs> chef Abby has a bakery as well. And I think we would both agree that one of the biggest challenges is uh, people. Finding great people, finding people who understand what you're trying to do in your bakery or your restaurant 
um, finding people who are as passionate about the product that you're making as you are and who are committed to recreating your recipes exactly the way you want. I think that that is one of the hardest things because if you think about it, all of you are in culinary because you love to cook or you love to bake. And all of you are probably working somewhere now or you're gonna go off and work somewhere. But I think the hardest thing is when you go to work for somebody, you know, you got into this business because you love to cook or bake and probably you go home and you think, what do I wanna make today? I wanna make a croquembouche, how wonderful. <laughs> But when you work for somebody, you can't just go in and make whatever you want. You have to go in and find out what it is that they want you to make. And then you have to learn that. And then you got to do it over and over and over again. So that's the challenge from your point of view. From my point of view as an operator, I know that all of you have so much talent and like you want to add this to the menu. But before I can add this to the menu, there are so many things that I have to think about in terms of our current menu and how does it fit in. And, do we have enough space in the walk-in to add another, you know, another couple of ingredients? And, and I might not be able to. And so the challenge is to continue to motivate someone like Nicholas who wants to create all these desserts and to tell him, you know what? Learn my desserts. Learn them really well. Learn them for a year or two, for more than a couple of years. Stay for a while. Absorb all of that knowledge. And then go off and get, get it somewhere else and get it somewhere else and then eventually do your own thing. So I think the biggest challenge is is trying to embrace all of the creativity that all of you all bring to cooking and baking and to, to, to celebrate it, but also try to motivate you and make you understand that while we love that, the business of operating a business is that people are coming to Flower Bakery because they want the pastries that I have created and that is what they want. And that's not to say that they don't want your pastries as well, but it, it is not as an easy switch to just say, oh great, that's so great, let's put it on our menu too. So there's a lot of, you know, you, you don't want to squash any, bub any, burst any bubbles. You want everybody yes. to enjoy what they're doing. But finding great people who want to do what you want to do is very hard. I have another one. Uh, what it, um, inspired you to expand your business? Great question. Um, expanding the bakery was never something I had in mind. I opened one bakery. And I loved it so much that I actually um, ended up buying a little apartment upstairs from the bakery so that I could just live and work in one building. And for six years, that's exactly what I did. Um, and then what happened is uh, Christopher, my, my husband, um, we, 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 we started dating back then after I opened the bakery. And he had had multiple restaurants. And he saw flour as something that could expand. And I just thought, gosh, I, don't, I, I really don't want to or need to. But he could tell that flour was pretty special. And then finally, I was convinced because we had so many great staff at our original bakery. And when you have one baker, one bakery, then you only have one of every position, right? You have one manager and one chef and one assistant manager and one assistant pastry chef. And you have all of those people. And until somebody actually, until somebody actually leaves, there's no place for growth. So we ended up hiring you know, a manager, we had a pastry chef, we had an assistant pastry chef, we had all these positions, but everybody underneath them was looking up and saying, well, I have to wait for you to leave before I can actually grow. And after about six years, I had an amazing staff, some of who were in leadership and some who wanted to be in leadership. So opening a second bakery was in part to allow for other growth opportunities for the team so that they could grow. And in fact, we still have of that Crew. We still have seven people who worked in the original bakery who still work at the bakeries now. And they've all been able to grow and take on more responsibility. Cool. So let me just uh, yes. take a pause real quick. So the sugar syrup has caramelized. So it's nice and brown. Can you guys see there? But it's also really, really hot and liquid right now. So we're actually just going to keep talking until it thickens. So right now you can imagine as I pour it, it's like liquid and sort of like the, the uh, praline. It was like super liquid. And then as it cools, it's gonna get more and more viscous. And as it gets viscous, then we are going to spin the sugar on top of this croquembouche. So keep the questions coming, because we gotta okay. wait until, yes. Did you have any struggles or discrimination when you opened your bakery in Boston? So I definitely had a lot of struggles, um, but honestly, in terms of discrimination, I 
I may have, but I was not aware of it. I don't know that I really thought a lot about it. And I think that is not to diminish any um, discrimination that people might experience out in the world. I do think that owning and operating a business is so freaking hard that everything feels like it's against you when you first start out. And so I may have had some discrimination, maybe. I, don't, I honestly don't know, but I, I do feel like um, if I had it, I was not aware of it. Everything was very, very hard, and it wasn't because I was female or Asian. It's because it was just really, really hard. And the struggles were real. Uh, I wanted to sell flour the entire first year that I had it. Um, I, I mean, I had good days, but I had a lot of bad days because you have your dream bakery in your head and you plan it and you think about it and you write the menu. I still have the original notebooks with all the sketches of the desserts that I wanted and I knew exactly how everything was going to look and I had the sense of what people would experience when they walked in the door. Um, and you know, you have that in here and it's like, it's what you want to do and then you open a business and then it doesn't always happen like that. And there are days that I would walk in and everything, it was like opposite day. It's like, if I want you to be greeted when you walk in as a guest, I would walk in and nobody would greet you. If I wanted everybody to get a smile, everybody would be frowning. If I wanted to put milk in my coffee, the milks would be empty. It was like every day was a new challenge because I wasn't, I wasn't doing what I had, had envisioned. And you're working so hard day in, day out. I mean, I worked from 2 a.m. until 9 p.m. You know, for the first many weeks, many months, I just kept working and working. And to have it not be perfect was really tough. So the struggle to stay motivated and stick with it was extremely hard. Um, I eventually uh, did find somebody, a couple people who worked for me. After about a year, I finally was able to create a small team that was able to support me and the dream that I had. And so then it was able to keep going. But until I was able to find those people, every day I felt like I was going to battle and losing, and then waking up to go to battle again and lose. Um, so that was the biggest struggle. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I think you know. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Um, how did it feel to beat Bobby Flay? So beating Bobby Flay was amazing. Um, like I was explaining earlier, it's definitely not a staged competition. And you're, you don't realize it at the time, but you're in front of national you know, television that's going to be broadcast across the United States. And your thing that you think is pretty darn good is now going head to head with his thing. And so you know, his sticky bun was really good. Um, I think ours was better. So when we won, it was, it was a game changer. It was interesting. We filmed, I still remember, we filmed in March. It came out in July, and it took us about an entire year until July of 2008 to finally catch up to the demand of sticky buns. When we first uh, filmed the episode, we probably made two dozen, maybe a day. And then once that episode aired, people, we, we sold two dozen within the first minute. Somebody would call and just say, I'm taking them all. And as you know, as bakers, you can't just generate sticky buns. It's brioche. It it's, takes time. It's yeast. The yeast dough takes you know, two days to sit and ferment and, all, and proof and all of that. And so we had such a hard time figuring out how to keep our demand, um, uh, not the demand, keep the supply going. It was, it was really tough. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your favorite comfort food? Uh, my favorite comfort food is... Uh, I grow, I, I'm Taiwanese, and my mom, um, uh, my mom's cooking is something that I, I always, you know, I'm always excited when she comes to visit, and I love um, just a bowl of, like, warm rice, kind of, I like it when it's a little bit soft, and then a little bit of her tofu, and a little greens, and I could just sit there and just eat that all day. <laughs> it's so delicious. Do you have any um, favorite role models or people who inspire you? So I would say my, uh, my biggest role model, and I'm glad he's not here because he would be extremely embarrassed, uh, but my husband. Uh, he really does inspire me to be a better baker, a better business person um, every single day. Uh, I have a very, uh, I have a very, I have an ability to focus really well on something. So when I opened the bakery, I just, I wanted this bakery, that's all I wanted. And he's really able to kind of take me outside of my focus and see the bigger picture and see that my role is not just to be a great baker, but I also want to and should be mentoring people and teaching and sharing what I know. And 
typically, I, with, without him, I don't usually like to stand up in front of people and do something like this, but he's really been so encouraging um, and, and encourages me to share everything that I know. And, and because of him, I've grown to love being in environments like this where I can share my knowledge. But it's definitely through his, his mo he motivates me every day. Cool. Um, if you could think of four words um, to say to some of our students who might want to open their own business or patisserie. Four words. Uh, so I'm going to limit it to maybe not four words, but four phrases. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say, if you want to open your own place, it's, I can't do four words. I'm going to do four yeah, I, I, It's yeah. harder than you think. It's more rewarding than you think. Uh, I think it takes an incredible amount of perseverance. If you look around at anybody who's open right now, not, and not, I'm not talking pandemic, I'm just talking in general, anybody who's opened a restaurant, um, yes, it might be great, and yes, the chef could be great, and the manager could be great, and all that great stuff, but, but the biggest reason why any restaurant or any bakery or any food business or any business is open is that person who opened it persevered through all of the hard parts. Because even the most successful restaurateur, you look at them and you think, wow, they have this great career and it must be so easy. You pick their brain and it's, it's pro it was probably harder for them than everybody else. But sticking with what you want to do and, and having a vision and, and, and and knowing that that's what you have to do, that is what will keep you going. Way more than four words, but it is, <laughs> it is so important. So if you have an idea of what you want to do, you will get there. The question is, will you keep going and keep happy with it? So you have to have a deep passion for the work. Otherwise, it will be so, like I said, in that first year, I wanted to sell it so many times. There's going to be so many hard times. But if you want to keep, if you want it, just keep going, and you will, you will get there. Yeah. Um, what do you look for in an employee? In an employee, uh, I look for attitude. I mean, I think every employer will say that. Specifically for me, what that means is somebody who is eager to learn, um, who is excited to come to work, uh, who is eager to be a good teammate. Uh, we work as, as a team. There's nobody who works by themselves. Um, and so it's got to be somebody who really wants to work and share with the people around them. Um, I think that those are the biggest things. Like you've, you've got to want to learn. You've got to be excited to be there. You've got to be excited to work with people. Uh, and I think also, even if you're in the kitchen, to have, you know, there's front of house people and there's back of house people. Front of house um, are naturally hospitable. Front of house people like to be in the public eye or, or among the guests, and they like to, to make guests uh, experience great. Um, back of house, we tend to be a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit shyer or a little bit more private. Um, but at the same time, we also like to be hospitable just in a very different way. So I think we look for people who, who want to share and want to give, whether it's front of house or just share your baking talents. <laughs> Okay, we have about five more minutes. Okay. Um, what would you summarize as your philosophy behind flour? Our philosophy behind flour is actually really simple. We, we tell all of the staff this, that everybody who walks through the door, that you leave happier than when you walked in. And we don't mean just guests. We want the vendors who deliver us our flour. We want the repair guy who fixes our mixer. We want you, the staff person who comes in. We want you all to leave a little bit happier uh, than when you walked in because of great food, great service, um, and great teamwork. Nice. <laughs> any more questions? All right, one more. Okay, Are great. there any plans for another cookbook in the future? So I don't think at this point I'll write another cookbook. Um, although Christopher will say I've said that four times and I've written <laughs> five now. So, but honestly, I don't have anything in the works right now. I am really really proud of the latest one i really put kind of everything i knew into it um, and if i did write another cookbook i would lo love to write a kids baking book i think that would be really fun uh, 20 recipes and we have so many um, staff members that have kids now that i've gotten to know over the years and i, I just think it'd be a really fun group thing to bring them all into the kitchen mm -hmm. and, and bake with them 
Okay, so I think we are now It's a little warm, but I think we got there. So I don't know if you all saw, but when we were um, cooking the sugar, it took a little while to get mm -hmm. the sugar to actually cook. And so it was kind of, kind of cooking slowly, which is uh, not something great for sugar because it, it causes the uh, sugar crystals to form. And I can tell that this melted pot of sugar is already starting to crystallize a little bit which means that the sugar strands aren't quite as, as um, delicate as we want. But I think, can you see how it's clumping? Yeah. I think because it just cooked and cooked yeah, so no, slowly. It yeah, it turned, right? exactly. Yeah. But we're gonna try. So you can see now that the sugar is starting to drift, um, come off of this slower than just uh, pure, pure hot sugar. So now I'm just gonna lift it up and then I'm going to spin it, which means I'm just going to flick it. This is the messy way to do it. You can also, <laughs> this is how I learned how to do it. I, get, I don't know why, but. Well, I think if you build like a little cage and, you know, and, but yeah, I, I don't know that there's a non-messy way. Yeah, exactly. So you can see all I'm doing is I'm taking the sugar that's falling off of the, of the offset spatula, and as it falls off, it actually forms these sugar strands, these beautiful threads. To turn it a little bit, and we'll just keep going. And it's really just about getting the right temperature of the sugar so that it spins into these beautiful gossamer threads, which then you can decorate all over your croquembouche. So the way I do it is I just spin directly onto the croquembouche, and then as the threads kind of collect, I get enough threads to collect, and then I gather, and then use it to decorate now this is gonna be really tricky to do in Hawaii because there's so much um, humidity here. But I think you can see, and the humidity, so what did we learn? We learned that sugar is hygroscopic, which means it attracts, it attracts water. So all of these sugar strands, in probably the next 30 minutes, they're going to absorb all of the water that's in this humid air and start to dissolve. But until then, we're gonna have a beautiful cage of sponge sugar to decorate. There we go. I think that does it. Yeah. yeah. So I encourage you to try this at home, but make sure that you put lots of newspaper around or else you're gonna be cleaning for a long time. Thank you so much, everybody. I've had such a great time teaching through Zoom, teaching the students here. Thank you again for all of your support. Mahalo.